Well, hey, you cats and kittens, you donners and blitzens. Just want to let you know, this is the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. Come back. I am Ray, and today I will be reviewing several books that I won't disclose at this moment, but they're going to be Delver's Golden Handcuffs. Um, there's a tower climb, and and now yeah, there's, there's some other stuff here we're going to be doing. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to tell you everything, because you know what? It's a surprise. So, uh, get ready, uh, and we'll get into this. Uh, we'll be reviewing just those three today. It's going to be a short one. I've uh, been really busy. Can't keep up. Got a lot of stuff to get done here. So, sit back, relax, and remember, as Dr. Johnny Fever once said, Booga! Oh, yeah. Okay, first up is Critical Failures 4. Um and I'm just going to say it like this. I'm really kind of reviewing the series from up to this point. I think I've only reviewed book one. So I'm going to kind of give you a brief overview of the series and why I'm kind of finished from this point forth. Um, Critical Failures, book four, Creatures and Cav- Caverns and Creatures um, series by Robert Bevan, uh, narrated by Jonathan Sleep. Um, 10 hours and 33 minutes is the time. Hey, said a familiar voice. Hey, come on, man, get up. Tim ignored it. Don't you roll over on me. Rise and shine, bucko. The slapping and kicking was more difficult to ignore. Tim opened his eyes and swatted Frank's hand away. Chill out, dude. I'm up. Why has everything got to be at the crack of dawn with you? You went to sleep at the crack of dawn, said Frank. Right now is the crack of mid-afternoon, and we've got some brainstorming to do. He held out a mug. Drink this. Brainstorming, said Rhonda carrying some dirty breakfast dishes behind the bar. With this group, my forecast is mostly cloudy with a slim chance of brain. Cooper yawned and scratched his balls under his loincloth. He looked about as rough as Tim felt. So like I just said, this is a review of the series up to book four. I have reviewed other books, uh, like I said, I think number one, but I'm going to talk about the overall arch and why I think I'm just completely done with the series in general. Bevan starts out with one of my favorite concepts, and if you've paid attention to the show or watched the show in any way, you will know one of my favorite concepts is um, role-playing gamers get pulled into their gaming world, um, and then they have to like act as their characters would. They keep their minds and stuff like that, um, and, and they literally live their roles. Okay, I love it, because why? I, I grew up with role-playing games that you played on a tabletop. You know, video games, were, it was Pong when I was a little kid. Uh, and we got moved into, like, the, the word-based movements, like you had on your, your Commodore 64, like Adventureland uh, or Dracula's Castle. Uh, and it wasn't until a long time later that you actually had actual um, role-playing ability uh, for video games. And so, like, if, if you ask me when you say, like, game lit or little RPG, where does my mind go? I always go back to, to the RPG stuff, um, the more RPG stuff rather than the lit stuff, or actually I should say the crunchy kind of stuff for video games. Um, lit RPG is great and I love it. Um, and it's probably one of the best genres there is for, for, for literature. But, uh, you know, it has like certain things that I can connect with more in some aspect or some, like I love dungeons I love portals. Like, so, like, um, I'm reviewing um, Delvers here in a few minutes, and Delvers is like one of the best portal series I've read, and it really got me into portals. Okay. Um, so, there's all these different genres of, of books, and this one is my favorite type. So, here with, with this, they, they start off great because it was, it was an introduction to a style of writing that I love. Um, the, the characters inhabit the body, or the, the, the Players that have the characters' bodies, they keep their minds. There's an evil DM who they have to outwit. And the perils of the new world, combined with that, is a combo that, you know, that just really works really well. I mean, there's this, this, this belief that we're in a real world, and there's this evil mechanisms by a dungeon master who's just this complete nerd um, that's vindictive. Um, so the initial premise and first novel were, were just great. I mean, who doesn't like an orc that craps himself every time he turns around? Um, the third book, you know, you go through it. There's, there's, it's a, it's a good arc from book one to three. 
Um, like there's a really cool vampire subplot and the heroes have to figure out a way to get back home. They have to figure out a way to stop the evil DM. Um, you know, before, and when they do get back home, they have to go back and actually bring in some other people from their world back with them in tow. Um, the problem is, is the series went from being humorous and God forgive me for using this phrase to being utterly cringe. And I mean that because I don't even know if I'm using this term correctly, but I cringed throughout most of book four. Uh, I was also bored to death in book four. The short jokes, the, the poop jokes, the gay jokes, they're nothing new. Um, and there are no points where it, it was it was like organic or felt like it was coming from like a place in sincerity more. It was kind of like, I just have to do this. Um, there were points where it just felt super forced and completely unfunny to me. I actually stopped halfway through book four and let it sit for a long time before coming back to it in the hopes so that it just wasn't in the right frame of mind. But no. So so what happened? What what changed for me? First of all, it wasn't the narration. The narration's great. Jonathan Sleep is amazing. Okay, so I'll get into him a little bit here. Uh, first of all, the humor never wavers. It never changes. It never grows. It never becomes something more or, or develops at all. It's the same juvenile bunch of fart jokes that they start out with. It's kind of like, like reading a Stephen King novel. Okay, if you read a Stephen King novel, there's going to be like one stupid character in there who does like either a couple things. Like he'll pick his nose and eat his boogers or he'll, he'll fart and think it's funny or he'll crap himself or any other number of gross things. He's covered in acne or he's fat and he's covered in acne or whatever. You know, like in, in the stand, it was Hawk. You know, he was this greasy uh, acne ridden guy. And it wasn't until he became evil that he looked cool and lost weight and he cleared his skin. So evil is a good way to improve yourself physically. Um, and I think it's just because Stephen King is a self-loather, and that's how he views himself. Like, I don't know if he actually eats boogers or if he did, but I, I just think that every character, there's always one character in his book that's like that, where they're in half-wits. And I think that it's just that he has this part of himself he hates, and that's where he projects all of it. I mean, this is just opinion. But I, and I hate Stephen King, but I've read so many Stephen King novels because my Aunt Peg uh, loves Stephen King, and she knew I used to like to read I still do, but I, I actually read like the books, and she'd be like, "Hey, I got a new Stephen King book. You want to read it?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't have anything else to read." And because I was a poor kid, I didn't have the money to go buy a book every week, or every two weeks, or every month. So I like would take hand me downs, and I would read whatever was ever given to me. And I just learned over time like Stephen King is great for short stories, novels not so much. And I don't care what you say, he just does not know how to end a book. And that's my personal opinion. But he does not know how to end a book ever. Um, and so like. Stephen King has all these horrible characters and that, you know, like they, they bottle their farts. Okay. That's what it's like here. Robert Bevan does this here with every single character, you know, whether it's short jokes with Tim or, or, you know, um, the or crapping or vomiting or sneezing snot everywhere or urinating his pants or all four of the things at the same time. That's it. And his stuff isn't funny anymore. And neither is Bevan's, horse joke after the 7,000th time it's used. The first 30 times the horse joke was used, I laughed. I said, this is pretty funny. Now I just really feel bad for the horse if something bad happens to it. I feel really horrible because it's just it's just not funny. So when it, it becomes like a thing about animal cruelty, I have to step back and go, when did this not become funny? You know, and so like, you know, it's just like he's got like these characters being gay and doing gay things. Nothing wrong with that, as Seinfeld would say. But it's just because he thinks it's funny and it doesn't translate this funny to me. It just does not come across. And, and like my best friend is gay. OK. And, and he, I talked to him about this and he didn't find it funny. And so it's not me. Like I said, I, I kind of confirm a lot of times or I confer with other people um, what my, my ideas are just to make sure I'm not like totally out there. And like I said, a lot of that stuff just did not hit home and Really, like even like the vampire stuff, it was getting old and, you know, Ravenous was getting just everything about it to me just kind of started to fall apart. Now, maybe I just have fatigue from this series, but I'll be frank with you. I've been parsing out books two, three and four so that I can just enjoy them as time goes on. And I didn't like gorge or binge in any way, shape or form. So as I was listening to this book, I just kept going, when 
When, when will it end? When? Why is it not happening? Why is it still going on? And I never do that. I mean, I do, but not like, like I, I didn't do that the first three books. This book just did not handle it for me at all. What else? I mean, the characters, all of them, they literally become dumber in this book. Maybe dimension hopping ad adversely affects brains, but no one acts like they have a bit of sense in their heads in this book. And then, I mean, no one. Yes, usually, like, you know, there's a couple of them that act like they're idiots, but every single character acts like idiots. Even Tim, who is, like, the mainstay of the series, who is really great, he's a believable character, even he just gets lost in the, in the stupidity, and, and he becomes more like a... a I don't want to call him like a non-player character, but he, he's more like a background character uh, because there's so many people in this book now. There's just literally so many characters. You can't keep track. Like instead of the core group, there's a thousand other people. There's the guild people and there's other that they brought back with. It. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. I couldn't keep track and did not want to. Um, it was just insane. Um, I don't know. The only interesting part to me that was even slightly workable was the invention of a new god that was like a funny bit because it was new and it was different um and it was it was a surprise um but other than that i mean like i just i, I lost it i just couldn't do this book and like i say i finish it all the time um i always finish a book and i had to step away from this now had i read this um with a physical book i would have felt like scrubbing my eyes out with sandpaper as it is I literally want to clean my ears out with a sewing needle. Um, and again, it's not because of Jonathan's sleep. It's because just shoddy, shoddy writing. Um, the, the story just, it fell apart. Like I said, the humor, it, it's just like, but um bum psh ba dum bum psh ba dum bum psh Oh, you've heard this? but dum bum psh Oh, let me tell you about my wife. Take my wife, please. The same joke over and over and over again. Um, no matter how many times he tries it, it's the same thing. And it just is flat. The entire way through. Now, this is not, and I reiterate, not the fault of Jonathan Sleep. No. He is the one bright spot, and he does his best to make this book work. It's just too bad that Bevins does nothing to help him succeed. Now, yeah, I mean, like, Jonathan Sleep is not, like, renowned for doing female voices. He's kind of, like, got two in his pocket, and one ain't the, the best of them. But he does, like, a really decent job, and he tries. And I give that to any narrator. Like, you know, not everybody's going to do a female voice. I don't think I could pull off... A respectable female voice at all if you ask me to do it okay i could try and it would come across as a man trying to sound like a woman but that would be about it jonathan does okay so i can't fault him for that but the story itself is just i'm done with it i'm done um you, you want to know the bad part i have all the short story on audiobooks um, there's like four of them or whatever it is and i have the other books up to book six because i grabbed them all way back when i read the first book and i, I started you know, and that was what he had written up to. And I've been parsing them out so that I can have something to read and enjoy when, you know, I didn't have anything else to get into. And I will never finish them. And, and I go, that's a lie. I'll finish it because I have the series, but I won't buy book seven, eight, nine hundred and twelve, whatever he's got up to at this point. I, I just, I'll have them so long. I've had them for so long. I can't even turn them in for a refund. Not that I would. I bought them and I'm stuck with them. It's on me for being foolish. It's not the author's fault that I didn't like, you know, check things out or I, should have expected him to possibly not maintain his level, okay? Because I think a lot of this stuff through here now is just about how people maintain levels. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So I'm stuck with him. I'll probably eventually finish the short stories and then move into books five and six. But once I'm done with them, it's just, and the only reason why I'll do that is because I just can't leave things undone. If I have it, I'm going to read it. Period. That's all the only reason why I would do that. Um, so it's on me for being stupid. I mean, I just can't help myself. Up until now, the series itself was a solid seven and a half. First book was probably in the eights. This book is a 6.5. I didn't enjoy it. You might. And I know the series has some staunch fans. There's people that talk about it all the time. I just don't get it anymore. I really don't. Um, it's just at some point, you've got to have things happen that just change or get some new jokes. Um but I'm just not with that humor. If you want funny, get Noob Town or the good slash bad guy series. You'll be much happier. Six and a half stars. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, so next book is Tower of Ruin, Volume 1 by Wolf Locke. Narrated by Travis Baldry. Uh-huh. 
uh, which is in a series Pandemonium hyphen Afterlife, uh, which has a length of four hours and nine minutes. The frozen walls of the cavern glistened and the cooking fire crackled as fat dripped from the mutton roasting on the spit. The meal offered a reprieve from the constant pressure of battle. Summoned minions of stone and ice patrolled the cave fortress that Cain had carved into the face of the mountain in hopes that other survivors would join them. That goat was the last one. We've eaten the rest. We were lucky to find a whole clan of satyrs living here, Jacobs lamented bitterly as the smell of food filled the cavern. They ignored the lingering question of where the next meal would come from. Jacobs leaned forward and his ornate black armor creaked from strain as the most powerful man alive turned the spit. I don't think we'll have to worry about starving to death, Audrey commented as she looked past the smoke towards the entrance of the cavern. Her eyes were orbs of pale white, a sign she was using her minions to extend her vision. There, shallow tremors were beginning to shake loose the icicles that framed the entrance. So, you know... I always say I like short stories and I look for short stories uh, that I really sink my teeth into. And my biggest complaint by far is this book is too short. So it really qualifies for me. I mean, it's a four hour book um, for what I'm looking for. Um, it really, it's one of those books though that you want more as soon as you're done with it. You're like, what the heck? Where's the rest of it? I need more. And I mean, you're left wanting so much more in, in that sense. I suppose the book kind of reminds me of the Lux Stat Strategy by Blaze Corvin, um, you know, The Secret of the Old Ones, um, and, because it was a really concise but impactful novel. Same thing here. Um, the book is a tower climb novel, so fans of that subgenre will rejoice and rejoice. And it is also one of the sort of time travel back to the start novels that seems to get paired up with tower climbing a lot for some reason. And if it's not a tower, it's usually like some sort of level that you got to go through. But you get the point, right? I mean, you, you go through it, you get redone, and you got to go start all over again and save everything with your memories of what happened before. Um, whether it's Reborn Apocalypse or, you know, Towers of Heaven, those sorts of things. So, anyway, basically, the MC exists in a tower that you, you go through. It's got infinite levels, um, which means no matter what you do, eventually you're going to fail. You can't win. Um and when you die, you start out completely new all over again with no memory of anything else. So you don't learn, you don't, you don't get experience, you don't gain power. You get reinvented every single time. So it's kind of like a reset that just doesn't really do much for you. Uh, you're just there to like suffer, basically. So suffer. Um, I just, every time I say that, I, I think of Judy Tenuta talking about the Pope, and she's like, the Pope said to me, Judy, can I come over and touch your velvet painting of Elvis that cries? And she says, Suffa, Pope. So, sorry, I laughed at that. Um, it, just, it just clicks in my head. I have these errant thoughts, and I'm tired. So it makes me do this. Anyway, basically, the MC Daniel. Daniel gets to keep his memory, and even gets a cool weapon, after a vote takes place between him and a couple other people about who should go back in time with their memory intact and have a chance to make changes in a difference. Um, the problem is the tower has these like overseers on each floor, and they're pretty much unstoppable the first time that he went through um, to do this battle. Um, and now he's got to like do it all over again, but knowing that you know he doesn't have the, the, the ability to do it. It's kind of like a conundrum. Like, how is he going to get through this? Um, but it's fun. Um, the novel isn't perfect. There's a mass of characters who are kind of introduced at some point, but seem to be there for something else down the line, like in book two or three, uh, as they just kind of show up and then they're gone. Now, fans of Crunch, you know, when it comes to lit RPG, may be in for a bit of a letdown, as the book is not packed with stats, but that works for me. Just I'm just fine with that. Okay, I'm not, I, I don't need Crunch in my cereal. I, you know, I can eat soggy cereal. I don't have to have a lot of Crunch or stats. And I only say this, because those are the two biggest flaws of the book, other than the length. And like I say, I enjoy the length of the book. I just want more. So I need like book two, three, four, all ready to go. Uh, the book is a quick, wild ride packed with action, old gods, evil gods, and there's lots of tower climbing. Daniel is rather likable, but I think he kind of lacks either leadership skills or people skills or something. I don't think he knows exactly how to, to handle people. Just Let's just say he, he tries his damnedest to get things done. 
and I, and I mean that in a very literal sense because if you ask me, they're in hell. Um, whether he is or not, I just that's the way it, it you when you look at there and the things you go through, um, you know, this is like a horror movie where you go through like all these terrible, horrible levels, and no matter what you do, in the end, you know you're never going to make it. Um, so he's got like this really horrible f- thing to face, and I think he does well at, does so admirably. But you know, man, I couldn't have done it. Um, so you know, there's all this stuff Daniel has to go through. It's pretty brutal, but simultaneously cool as hell. So again, here's another um, Travis Baldry story. Okay, another book. What can I say? I love the guy. I, I keep saying I'm not going to do another uh, review with him in it to kind of give other people a chance. And then I don't even think about it. And I'm like, oh, I, I got this pile of stuff. And here's this book with Travis that I, I'm, I enjoyed. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this one. And dang, if he doesn't sneak in on me. He really gets in and does one literal hell of a job doing his voices. He is a great fit for the story. And he does one heck of a job creating auditory illusions. Um, I, I think that the, the best way to, to say this is um, he created narration. Um, he is a narrator that is made for action. Um, he is a narrationator. Now, just just, just just stick with narration. I think that's a good word. Um, he does narration very well. Um, he, he's very visual with his, his, his voice. Um, and he's great to listen to. I just, I just, I could listen to him tell me stories about like how he went to the store to buy milk. Okay. So this is kind of a short review, but the book is four hours long, and if I don't get into details, I can't tell you a lot because um, I don't want to spoil stuff. It's more of a novella, really, but it is so worth the time. I'm hoping the next installment will be longer, um, and I know I'm only doing three books this week, but this is easily the best of the bunch. It's more like a quick, short jab uh, that, you know, pow, that does the job in one shot rather than being a prolonged beating that gets bloody but does nothing more than get blood in the carpet and there's no point to it. Um, this one kind of knocks you out and then moves on. It hits you in, in, the, in the tenders and it's out the door. Uh, so there's a lot of fun in those few hours that you have with Daniel. Uh, my final score is 8.2 stars. The writing, near action. Yes, near action. And I'm trademarking and copywriting that right now. So that's it's mine. No one else can use their action. Uh, they meld together for a fun burst of freshness. So don't miss out on fun, fights, fury that all take place in the Tower of Ruin. Just remember, the tower might be ruined, but the story's not. So check it out. You'll like it. Okay, so for my sound booth spotlight, here we go. Delver's LLC. Golden Handcuffs by Blaze Corvin, narrated by Jeff Hayes, narrated, narrated by the estimable, 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 I don't know, I don't know know what I'm talking about, I'm tired, it's late, I'm really tired, Um, narrated by Jeff Hayes, that's what I'm trying to say, Uh, for the series of Delver's LLC, this is book four, and has a book length of 11 hours and 11 minutes, that's 111, go play those numbers, pretty babies. Jada Mac, come out! I need to talk to you. There was movement in the shadows, and Alula leaned forward, narrowing her eyes to see. But when something moved into the light, it was huge, and she felt a strange, visceral instinct. Something in her primitive brain was screaming at her to run away or stay perfectly still. Hello, Nora. The creature moving out of the cave was red, scaled, and looked like a powerful, winged serpent with arms and legs. Its huge horns came to wicked points, and it had black spikes all over its body. Massive wings lay folded against its back. Lulula had seen a lot of monsters since she'd been on Ludus, and plenty of other scary things. This was the first time she'd seen anything like this before, though. Okay, so... uh... I'm going to preface this by saying that I love Blaze Corbin and have enjoyed every book of his I have read. That being said, I sadly have to say this is probably the weakest of any of his books that I've ever encountered. Why? There's several reasons, and I'm going to go into them right now. Um, first, the book really advances nothing. Um, other than the big reveal of what Dolos is afraid of and why he's been doing what he's been doing, 
the book kind of treads water. And I don't mean kind of, I mean it just does. It really doesn't make a lot of forward motion whatsoever. There are a couple of cool fight scenes, but for the most part, their severity is even lessened by where and how they take place, which I'll get into. Second, or as they say in sign language, second. This didn't really feel like a Delver's book. Not really. Um, and I hate to say it like that. Th this felt as much as a Nora Hazard novel as it did a Delver's. Now, I'm going to just go and say this right now. I enjoyed Nora Hazard quite a bit, okay? But she seemed to take up a huge chunk of this book's focus. Henry, Jason, and company got what seemed to be equal screen time with her when compared to the singular character of Nora. I mean, and I know that's probably inaccurate. They probably had a little bit more, you know, they may have had more whatever, but just honestly, if I if I look back at my memory or the way it felt, it felt like Nora was there as much as the guys and maybe a little bit more uh, than normal. I mean, I didn't really feel like I had Jason and Henry's um, perspective as much as I did Nora's, or even when I did have Jason and Henry, Nora was there giving her perspective as well. Um, so, you know, Jason, Henry, and company kind of, got semi-equal screen time, but I think this is what hurts the book the most. Um, if you didn't read the Hazard books, which is a possibility because I know there were a lot of people that didn't, um, you're going to be wondering who she is and where in the hell she came from, why she's even there, um, and, and why does she deserve such a big chunk of the book devoted to her. I mean, this to me is a, is a big obstacle, and, and again, I, like I say, I, I really appreciated Nora, loved her series, but you get like this really short, busy E.B. storyline where he goes off and does something. Um, and you get a couple of little things with the boys, but mostly it's like this weird romance thing pops up. Um, and then just a couple of little things here and there and, and a little bit of fighting. And otherwise, it's it's Nora, 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 um, the way it comes across. And, and I'm not saying that on my behalf. I've talked to other readers who've read this book. And that was like their biggest thing when I talked to them. I was like, I haven't had a chance to read this yet. I'm only getting your 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 feel for like did you enjoy the book? Don't give me any in information. Don't tell me like what you liked or didn't like. Just did you enjoy the book? And they would say, I've enjoyed the book, but that Nora was there and it just kind of threw me off. And I said, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. So I appreciate Nora, but there's there's a lot of stuff like A himself is mentioned but barely appears, uh, and we get to see the boys do a little bit of sparring a few times and some other stuff. But their presence doesn't seem to be as dominating as it should be. Um, you know, even Maureen and the other girls. I mean, there's not a lot of them time compared to, you know, that. So most of that I could really overlook if the story progressed. But aside from Dolos getting more fleshed out and an infestation taking place that kind of backs up his actions, I felt like a lot of fluff was there. Um, the issue is that this was, uh, there was little danger for the MCs. And the big fight between Nora and Maureen is mostly Flash because the outcome is completely unsatisfactory. I mean, if you've read the book and you've gone through it, when you get to the thing, you just kind of say, this whole thing was pointless. And that was really frustrating because you want to see at least some sort of decision. And so let me let me preface this, okay? I've been using preface a lot lately. It's because I'm tired, so forgive me. Um, if you ever watch Star Trek, you know they have this thing called the holodeck. And holodeck is really interesting because you can go into it and do like anything you want. You can go to any time, any place, and make up characters, meet real people, not real people, but like representations of those people, and do whatever you want to do. Okay, so that would be like a good way to get like a side story going. So if you wanted to have um, Picard and Riker and the team like visit the 1920s, or, you know, the 1800s is Robin Hood or a Western. You could pull all that off without having to have a time travel story involved, okay? So the holodeck was great, and usually it was really good because you would have some sort of malfunction in the holodeck or something weird happening with the holodeck, which made it interesting. There is a plot element that is similar to the holodeck that takes away any real danger to the people that are participating. And to me, and I, I actually I just watched, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've re-recorded this now twice. This is the second time I'm recording this, because the first time I recorded it, none of my sound came through. Um, so I've had to re redo the entire show. So as I was like trying to figure out what was going on, I listened to Ramon talk about Golden Handcuffs, because I wanted to see what he thought. 
he liked that. He liked that aspect a lot. To me, it wasn't fun because there was no real um, concern, no danger. It was just kind of like, let's smash these people up. And if you know me, I'm a comic books fan. It reminded me of like Marvel versus DC or Marvel versus Capcom or Injustice, where you have like Batman fights Superman. So like in, in the old matchups where you had Spider-Man versus Superman and Batman versus Hulk. So for example, like Batman literally beat the Hulk. Okay. If you were to do this for real and you put the Hulk, a real Hulk in a, in a room with the Batman, I don't care what toys Batman has. He's not walking away, standing up. Okay. He's done. Um, but in, in the book, he, he literally hits the Hulk's diaphragm. He, you know, he hits him. The Hulk can't breathe. And so he, he uses gas that sedates him and he reverts to Bruce Banner. And that's how Batman beats the Hulk. Okay. And Marvel versus DC, uh, fans voted for like who would win. So Aquaman versus Submariner, Superman versus Thor, Wolverine versus Lobo, all these people, you know, Wonder Woman versus Storm. And, and the majority of the people that voted were like Marvel fans. So it was like really lopsided in a lot of ways, if you've asked me. And what they did was they then had like other little battles that weren't voted on. So like the teams that were winning overall um, by the vote, so, so Marvel did, DC had other heroes that beat the Marvel heroes. All right. And that was how they did things. So, like, you know, if Green Arrow were to go against Hawkeye, I would say Hawkeye would win because Hawkeye would cheat. Whereas Green Arrow, he's not that he's, like, perfect, but he, he's got some integrity to him. Hawkeye would cheat, and he would win. So that's why Batman wins, usually. He's, he's a cheater. So that was kind of like what this was here um, with the, the, the Delver's battle thing, okay? It just took away any realism to it whatsoever because any time they walk into it, there's going to be another set of rules, regulations. There's going to be circumstances that will change that will give one of the characters an advantage that the other one doesn't have. Or there will be something that will happen that will alter events so that if Henry went in there and fought um, Jason a thousand times, technically, you know, he, if he beat him the first time, he should win every single time, but he won't. OK, because there's no, it's not real. OK, there's no real danger. There's no real. So anything can happen there. And that's what I didn't like about it. It just took away a lot of the, the power of the characters. Uh, and it just was not fun for me to do that. Now, like I said, Ramon seemed to think it was pretty cool and he loved it. To me, it was just kind of like a what if scenario. And it just had taken agency away from everybody and it made everything that was happening pointless because I can hear about how Batman fights the Hulk and wins. And I know it's it's not real, uh, so what difference does it make? Okay, um, so here's the way it was, you know. So um, I don't know. Just like I said, the, the whole thing was just a little bit, a little bit forced. Okay, uh, the, the, in regards to well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, with Nora, if I hadn't read her books, I would have been left scratching my head. Okay, and I'm, I'm backtracking here a little bit, and I think. As it is, Blaze tried really hard to integrate her without lessening her in the comparison to Jason and Henry. And that is what happened is it felt forced. And honestly, I don't know if this is a move by Blaze that's absolutely pure genius or it's something that's going to fall really flat. Um, because one of two things are going to happen. Um, either people are going to read this and go, man, Nora's really cool. And I skipped those books. They're going to go back and buy those books. That's the genius part. Um the fall flat thing is, is this going to make people that didn't like the Nora books or didn't want to read them go, I don't want to read the rest of the series. So I'm kind of concerned. I'm hoping that it's going to be like, it's going to improve the situation. Um, it's pretty dicey. And all I can say is I trust him to do the right thing. That's W-R-I-T-E. Um, he's got the vision. He, he knows where his story's going. And I'm hoping, he, you know, he's got this ship on solid, smooth waters because right now it, it kind of feels weird. And, and, where I'm going with this is this is the fourth book in the series. Okay. Fourth book. And usually the fourth book is either the start of a new series. Cause you know, one, two, three trilogy, or it's a transitional phase. Okay. So we have three Nora books. We have three Delvers books. And now we have the fourth Delvers book, which is combining these two things. It's a bridge. Okay. This is where, um, blaze hitches, Nora to Delvers, and then he takes a train down the track, okay? Um, and 
there's really not a lot you can do in a situation where you're hooking up these trains. You've got to say, here's where this happens, this happens, this happens, and this happens. And, you know, they got to start working together and learn to work together and mesh. So you don't have a lot of things moving the story forward like you would want. And the perfect example of that is like Star Wars. In um, The Empire Strikes Back, that is one of the best examples of how to do a transition. It's the sophomore slump, usually. You like, you know, book two is usually a lot weaker than book one. Or, you know, whatever in any series. The second book, if it's a trilogy, always has this thing where nothing really gets to be done because everything interesting happens in the beginning or in the end. In the middle stuff, everything is kind of has to be static and you can't do a lot of changes. Uh, maybe you kill a couple people off here or there, but it's it's something that really doesn't take away from the overall story arc. And so, you know, eh, you're kind of stuck. You don't have this great big explosive um, entry into the series that you would want. And, and this is that point. Um, he's bringing in two trilogies. Um, and even though Delvers is not a trilogy per se, like Nora Hazard is literally a trilogy. Um, you've got two, three separate books, one, two, three for each series, um, coming together at this point, And he's got to get all this stuff done. And so the, really the basis that he needed to do was say, here's what's going to happen in the future. Here's what Dolos has been preparing for. Here's the way things are going. And this is how we're going to move out from this point. So there are really some things that I enjoyed. If you want to know, um, the fight scenes are really well written. Okay, like Nora and Maureen, it's a really well written fight scene. Um, the scene that was the best scene in the book for me was basically when everybody gets to go and meet finally their um, orbs representate representatives. Okay. So we get to see Mr. Rogers, you know, meet, you know, everybody else and so on and so forth. It was really funny. It was a really well-written scene. And to me, like when I think about this book, that's where my mind goes is that particular scene uh, that and the one where Dolos meets his um, siblings, so to speak. Um, those are the two standout most impressive scenes to me throughout the entire book. Um, you know, and I'm hoping that like, you know, once you, you read this, you'll see why, because it's very vivid, very powerful. It's got some humor to it and it's got some bite to it and it's got some danger to it. Um, and, and there are things laid out in those that really will have, um, an impact later on. Um, uh, like I said, those were like definitive hard points for the book. Most of the other stuff was kind of fluffy. So, um, like I say, Star Wars showed you how to do book two and, and you know, or, or movie two or whatever you want to call it. Um, and this just didn't kind of meet that standard for me. It was kind of a lot less. It was kind of like just get all this stuff lined up, which is fine. I, I really enjoy Blaze. I think, you know, he's got some of the most creative stuff out there. Um, but, like, there's this romance that comes out of nowhere. And, I mean, literally, it's like starts here and ends here really quick. Um, and I don't know how to to take it. I mean, it was just kind of like what happened here all of a sudden, like it was kind of just shoehorned in. If you ask me, it was like, he was like, well, I need to do this. And boom, there it was. It was just kind of like, what, where did that come from? Um, and any other, and I'm just calling it out because any book I would read, it did that. It was like, there was no um, precursor to it that I, have, I can remember. I mean, like it's been a long time since I read Delvers three um, or, or even Nora three. Um, to remember anything about this, but it, it just didn't really seem like it came up anywhere but here overnight. So it was just weird how that kind of got stuck in there and all of a sudden it just happened. Um, but aside from that, you know, um, I think there's some, some positive things for the book and that's what I was trying to get to. I actually enjoyed the book. I, and again, I'm going to say this. I enjoyed the book. Um, I just had some issues with it and I'm just letting you know what they are. So say what you will, but man, my man, Jeff Hayes, he pours his heart into this book. And I will re reiterate that this is where Jeff absolutely shines, he, doing a book all on his own. Um, Jeff is great in a team. He is a great uh, team leader when it comes to doing other voices. But Jeff does everything he can to bring this book to life. And his reading of Nora confronting Ma Maureen, very minor spoiler, it was awesome. Um, he put a lot of vitriol and anger in just the right places. This is pure Jeff, and since Jeff is the best, we all win when it comes to doing the audio portion of the book. I mean, it was just phenomenal. I mean, I just I, I miss not having Jeff do like an entire book. It's it's just too infrequent 
compared to what it used to be. Now he kind of like, and I, I respect it, he pops in um, for anything in sound booth, so he's always got his thumbprint in there somewhere. Um, but you really just got to have a lot more of Jeff. You just can never not get enough. Now, that being said, and, and you can yell at me here in, in the comments below, um, one of the things I, I wanted to say was I would have actually liked, and you can yell at me, to have had Emily Beresford br brought in to voice Nora. I mean, like I say, Jeff is great, but Emily really had three books to do this character. Okay? She had three books to make Nora hers. And I think that, you know, I don't think Jeff would have had a problem sharing the, the stage. I don't know if it was just a matter of, of compensation, like, you know, we just need to just do one person. But I would have liked to have had, you know, Emily come in and do this because she is Nora. Okay? And, you know, her version of Hazard is, is similar to, but not the same as Jeff's. So when you hear Hazard, you know, it's, it's a different take. And I don't want to say it threw me off. But it wasn't the same. And again, I'll take Jeff 100% of the time. Ah! <laughs> Hush. Hush, you chicken. All right. If, if, if Ramon... <laughs> I, I'm hoping Ramon uh, edited this out. My dog's still barking. My green screen collapsed on me. Um... I have a new new thing, and it's meant for a specific kind of chair. And, of course, it does not fit my chair in the slightest way. Um, so I kind of have to just stick it behind my back, and it just collapsed on me. So, um, anyway, I'm going to say, like, you know, Nora with Emily would have been great. Um, overall, like I said, it was good, really good narration. Uh, the book has some good character growth uh, and some leveling up on and out of nowhere. Um, <sighs> romance, like I talked about. Uh, and the mystery regarding Bezzy Eby are all there. There was a lot of positive things. Sorry, I'm still discombobulated from my collapse. Um, that said, the book is is really seemed to hit every point on the compass rather than having one solid direction. It just kind of felt like it left off where it should have started. Uh, for me, the holodeck stuff took away any real impact. It was kind of like playing Injustice or Marvel Capcom, a bunch of who would win scenario stuff that would change in every single playthrough. Batman beat Superman last round. Now it's the opposite. That was probably the one part of the book I could have done without. In actuality, for you comic book fans, you know, it just, it it just was not. I don't even want to say it, it wasn't worth it um, for what you got. I mean, it just like I say, like you you know, in reality, Flash is faster than uh, Quicksilver, and if you watch the movies, Quicksilver is way faster than the Flash. Okay, and 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 it's so out of bounds from compared to the comics to the movies, and it's the same thing. It just you just you don't get reality for what what I think it's worth, um, and that was the point that anybody could have beaten anybody at any point. Anyway, ultimately it was fun, but it was nothing um, really with gravity to it. My final score is seven point six stars. I enjoyed it, but not as much as I have any of other Blaze's books. Hopefully, um, given the direction the series will be taking. Um, things will get back on track by the time the next book comes out. I'm hoping hey, things are going to get better. And there's a better balance between the amount of time that Nora's there as opposed to like Henry and Jason and the others. Uh, because it is a big team, and Henry and Jason are the, the, the fulcrum for which everything else is lifted. Okay, you know, there's a lever and there's a fulcrum. They're the fulcrum. I mean, anything else can be the lever, but Henry and Jason for Delvers... They are the fulcrum. They are the thing that stands and gives it strength and is a brace. So, you know, if, if you're going to ask me who should have, like, primary, you know, stuff, it's going to be Henry and Jason. So, you know, that's just my opinion. But I know I'm not alone because I've talked to other people about it. Um, so, like I say, 7.6 stars. It's still good. I recommend it. I did enjoy the book. But it's not, like, something I would say... It, I think it's it's a transitional period, and it needs that that transition to get through it. So if you're a fan of Delvers, you need to check it out. What? That's it? The show's over already? I'm sorry, I only had time to do three today. Um, I'm hoping in the next couple weeks, once I get done studying for my possible new job, if I pass the test, which I may not do because I haven't been studying all that much, and I'm going crazy, um, and I'm down to the wire now. Down to the wire. Soon. Um, so I'm hoping I can get all this stuff done uh, ASAP, uh, get my 
unemployment stuff fixed because I haven't been paid in about five weeks now. I have one dollar left on my card. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do, but I find it funny um, that they can't pay me because they had issues with identity theft. Not me, just in general. And so I, I can't get paid. It's been five weeks. Believe it or not, pretty babies. It's true. So anyway, short show this week. I'm going to try and get back into the swing of things. I really promise um, once we get going here and I know what I'm doing and I have time to do things, uh, you would think that being unemployed would give me more time, and it really does not. Um, I actually am busier now than when I when I had a job because my wife keeps me crack a So anyway, thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate the time you're taking to watch or listen to the show. Um, if you want to support us, you can always like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page. Uh, or the YouTube page, or just share and like the video. I uh, sincerely hope you enjoyed the show. Um, remember, you can follow us on, there's a bunch of them. There's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and even audible.com. Yes, we are on Audible now. Um, so that's a real good benefit. Uh, now, just, just so you know, I would ask if you could to remember to always leave a review for any book that you've listened to or even read. Authors depend on reviews, and I wanted to say this so that you understand it very clearly. Um, a five-star review is great. A four-star review is for an okay book. You like it. Three-star is you wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Two stars is it really sucked. And one, it's the most horrible thing that you ever read in your life. And so what that means is, is if you say, I think it's a mediocre book, it's okay, it's not bad, and I would recommend you to check it out, at least try it, and you give it a three star, you're actually telling Amazon that the book sucks. So if it's okay and you enjoy it, give it a four star. And I hate to even tell people that, but that's the way it works. Amazon's rating system is flawed. So, you know, three stars, it means it sucks and it just goes downhill from there. So remember, four or five, if you enjoy a book, anything else, either you hated it and you don't want anybody to read it or don't leave a review at all. Because if you, you say, look, this is that bad, it's not bad, but it's okay, you leave it a three, you're hurting the author who did that. So give it a shot. Um, as always, I'm going to ask you to please have a good day. Go out and enjoy life. The sun is going to be shining soon. Uh, summer is approaching, and which means I'm going to be miserable. Uh, I hate summertime. I hate bugs. I hate heat. I hate sunshine. I am a winter kind of guy. I like ice, snow, cold, wind, bitter, bitter people. They are my sucker in life. I, I, I enjoy those things. I don't really make like the, the bitter people very much. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I get along with them pretty well. I'm pretty, pretty much it's misanthropic. So, uh, but for you normal folks, I know it's getting to be that time of year where everybody gets happy and they smile. My wife's out planting flowers and, and growing food for us now. Um, so um, get ready to enjoy things. Go out and just... Enjoy life while you can and cherish it and, and give everybody you know you, you love a hug. Uh, and just for the Little RPG Audio Podcast, I'm going to ask you to just keep listening.